I am Dr. Biju Raju and this is a brief overview on indirect ophthalmoscopy, one of the toughest technically demanding examination techniques in ophthalmology. These great minds contributed a lot to make ophthalmoscopy the most important invention that shaped the evolution of ophthalmology. If ophthalmoscopy shaped the evolution of ophthalmology, then Professor Charles Shippens shaped the evolution of vitreoretinal subspeciality with the invention of the binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. As you know, the retina can be viewed using a direct method or an indirect method. In the indirect method, the retina is viewed indirectly by viewing an aerial image formed by a high power plus lens called the condensing lens. This table highlights the main differences between the two techniques of ophthalmoscopy. The most important advantages of the indirect method over the direct is that the indirect method offers stereopsis and a larger field of view, both of which are absolutely necessary to evaluate a retinal detachment. Scleral depression, which is essential part of peripheral retinal examination and management of peripheral retinal lesions can be done only with the indirect method. Because in the indirect method there is a safe distance of almost one meter between the patient and the examiner, during the time of pandemics like COVID-19, it is far safer than doing a direct ophthalmoscopy, which obviously should be avoided at present. There is a whole chapter on optics of ophthalmoscopy in most textbooks and I would like to refer to the fine chapter on optics of ophthalmoscopy in Duane's Ophthalmology for further reading of optics. However, I would like to stress on two important aspects of optics related to indirect ophthalmoscopy. The first and the most striking feature is the use of a high power convex lens as I mentioned earlier called the condensing lens which makes the eye highly myopic. This results in a real inverted and laterally reversed image close to the principal focus of the lens. In addition, as you see in the direct method, the rays of light emerging from the periphery, that is the rays 1 and 4 are not reaching the examiner's eye. But in the indirect method, because of the condensing lens, the peripheral rays of light are also brought to focus at the plane of the aerial image, thus enabling peripheral viewing of the retina. In a binocular indirect ophthalmoscope, the optics convert the examiner's interpupillary distance or IPD of approximately 60 mm to 15 mm using a set of mirrors and this allows for stereopsis as both eyes simultaneously perceive a slightly different area of the aerial image. Another interesting aspect in the optics of indirect ophthalmoscopy is the amount of accommodation an examiner needs to exert to see the aerial image when there is a gross refractive change from emetropia. Here, in an emetropic eye, the examiner will have to accommodate for a distance of 40 cm to see the aerial image which is at the principal plane of the 20 diopter lens. The dioptric equivalent of 40 cm is 100 by 40, that is 2.5 diopters. In a myopic eye, the combination of the condensing lens that is plus 20 diopter and a myopic status of minus 5 acts as a more powerful condensing lens and thus the examiner has to accommodate only 2.4 diopters, 0.1 diopter less than he would if the eye was emetropic. Now let's see the opposite scenario where the eye is plus 5 diopter hyperopic. Here the examiner will have to accommodate for a shorter distance resulting in an accommodative component of 2.6 diopters, which is just 0.1 diopter more than that in an emetropic eye. Thus, we see that gross changes in refractive errors will not lead to gross changes in the accommodative demand on the examiner. That is why gross refractive errors do not have an impact on the clarity or focus of the fundus image with indirect ophthalmoscopy. Whereas, in the direct method, one needs to interpose the appropriate correction lenses on the recourse disc to adjust the focus in eyes with refractive errors. Now let's look at the instrument itself. There are two commonly available models of binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. The head mounted model is more sturdy and the more popular one. The spectacle mount is used for convenience and maybe portability as it can be hung around the examiner's neck when it's not in use. 
the instrument has an illumination source, observation optics and a housing which includes the power supply and electronics and a headband for mounting the instrument on the examiner's head. The knobs or levers on the sides are for changing the illumination spot size and for using filters like cobalt blue for fluorescein angioscopy, the green for a red free examination to look for nerve fiber layer defects and the yellow filter is supposed to be more friendly in light sensitive eyes. Preparation is as important as the examination technique. The indirect ophthalmoscope should be mounted comfortably on the head with most of its weight resting on the top band rather than tightening the circumband or the circular band that goes around the head. The IPD can be adjusted using the sliding eyepieces and this is a small pupil versus a large pupil setting. This is a small pupil setting and that's a large pupil setting where the illumination and the observation columns are farther apart. Now let's mount the indirect of thermoscope. As I said, adjust the eyepiece so that you get the maximum field of view. Then switch on the indirect and shine the light onto the wall or to the tip of the thumb of the examiner's extended hand to ensure that the light centers in the field of view at that distance. One eye and then the other should be closed to check this, adjusting the interpupillary distance of the oculars as needed. The lens holding hand is the most important part of the whole system that gives a steady, clear image. Always start holding the lens in the non-dominant hand. In the long run, it will help you draw fundus diagrams with ease as your dominant hand is free to draw what you see and as and when you see it and that speeds up your examination. Grip the lens with the tip of a flexed index finger and the ball of the extended thumb. This allows for moving the lens with varying degree of flexion of the index finger towards and away from the eye. Another important aspect is that one has to support the lens holding non-dominant hand on the forehead or cheek of the patient. Most of us use the extended third finger of the hand or the third and the fourth finger. All these points serve four purposes. Firstly, your hand is perfectly supported and steady. Secondly, the grip on the lens between the tip of the flexed index and the ball of the extended thumb help you move the lens towards and away from the eye. Thirdly, you can use the third finger to retract the upper lid as seen in this picture. And fourth purpose is to act as a pivot for tilting the lens. When examining with the indirect ophthalmoscope, the examiner makes sweeping movements to observe the retinal details. For this to happen, this imaginary line connecting the visual axis of the examiner the lens, the patient's pupil and the area of that fundus that is observed should always move together. And this is possible only by moving the examiner's head and tilting the lens simultaneously. Scleral depression is the most technically demanding ophthalmic examination technique. One can use various depressors that are available and can even use a cotton tipped bud. In fact, during this current pandemic, these buds are recommended for use as scleral depressors. Scleral depression makes it possible to visualize that part of the fundus that lies anterior to the equator. A second uh, and perhaps more important function is to enable the observer to palpate the retina and to examine the peripheral retina dynamically and from multiple angles in ways that can be only appreciated with scleral depression. The technique enables visualization of a retinal flap as it rises from the crest of an indented mount, differentiate a retinal break from a hemorrhage and see a tuft clearly with its vitreous attachments. This is a case of atrophic holes with a subclinical retinal detachment. You can see the movement of the mound of the depressor. With experience, you can go all the way up to the aura serrata and the pars plana. One of the important landmarks in fundus evaluation as well as drawing is the equator. The anatomical correlate of this landmark is the ampulla of the vortex veins. Here you see the different configurations of a vortex vein in an albinotic fundus. In the next patient who was evaluated prior to cataract surgery, 
a horseshoe tear was detected. There was a hemorrhage close to it. As you can see, when you palpate the retina with the scleral depressor, moving from side to side and up and down, you can see that the character of the hemorrhage doesn't change. But when you look at the horseshoe tear, you can see the tear opening up, the flap coming forward, the opercular moving, as you do a scleral depression in a dynamic fashion. To get an orientation of the inverted and laterally reversed image of indirect ophthalmoscopy, let us take the next case where there are three horseshoe tears centered superiorly at 12 o'clock. When an examiner who wants to do scleral depression at that point, he stands at a clock hour opposite to that that needs to be examined. So in this case, closer to 6 o'clock. And the scleral depressor is at the clock hour that needs to be examined, which is at 12 o'clock. And the patient looks towards that clock hour that needs to be examined. This is the image showing the real orientation of the retinal lesion. And this is the way we see on the 20 diopter lens. It is as though you are standing on the mount of the depressor and looking towards the disc. This is the side by side comparison of the actual image showing the retinal break centered at 12 o'clock and that's the direction towards the disc. Compare with that the orientation of the image on the 20 diopter lens. Here you can clearly make out that the image is vertically inverted and laterally reversed. This is a patient with a combined regmatogenous retinal detachment and choroidal detachment. You can see that the retina moves relatively freely while the choroid under the retina is more rigid. And this is the way you do a sweeping movement of examination reaching up to the periphery to locate the horseshoe tear. This is an aura serrata pearl. It is a clinical curiosity. You can see the dentate process, the pars plana, the aura serrata and the aura serrata pearl at the tip of the dentate process. They are usually seen in 20% of individuals and are thought to be drusen-like bodies in the periphery of the retina. The next patient is a young gentleman who presented with floaters following trivial trauma. He had an avulse retinal vessel, vitreous hemorrhage and a retinal break. Looking anteriorly, there was condensation of the vitreous which extended up to a zonal attraction tuft. Here you can see the aura serrata, the pars plana and the zonal attraction tuft with zonal attraction at the tip of the tuft. Because of its location in the far periphery, in the pars plana, a pars plana cyst is rarely documented. They are seen in about 5-10% to of individuals and have no clinical consequences. They are supposed to contain hyaluronic acid. The lateral boundaries of the cyst are usually the oral base. Acquiring good indirect ophthalmoscopy skills with scleral depression gives you an advantage of venturing into the far periphery of the retina, an area not ventured by many for the lack of adequate skill and technique. I hope this presentation encourages some of you to take up that challenge. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Indirect ophthalmoscopy is an art. And every time you get to see the spectacular image of the retina fill up the 20 diopter lens, it is absolute bliss. I hope this presentation will inspire you to genuinely be interested in performing serious indirect ophthalmoscopy. And probably inspire some of you to seriously take up vitreoretinal subspeciality as their career. Thank you very much KSOS and thank you very much Dr. Rajiv Sukumaran for this opportunity.